winning and losing is not a Jewish problem. We always lose, and it always turns out to be a win. Losing and winning is not our issue. That's not a Jewish idea. We are not worried whether we're blessed or cursed. Other religions are worried. Am I going to go to heaven? Am I going to go to hell? Am I going to be punished? Am I going to burn? We don't have that problem. So on Purim, we learned it doesn't matter whether Mordechai is blessed or cursed. He's Mordechai. That's all I need to know. And why am I against Haman? Not because he lost. Even if he won, he's Haman. He's not, he's not for me. It's like a good marriage. It's like a good marriage. If a man is really devoted to his wife and he sees a really beautiful woman, much more beautiful than his wife, doesn't matter. It means nothing. He can come home and say to his wife, I can't believe this. I saw a woman in the office today. She is gorgeous. And the wife says, oh, nice. It's not a threat. There's no competition. Mordechai is my guy. Haman, I don't care. He can be blessed. He can be winning. He can be on the top of the world. He's Haman, not my guy. That's the miracle of Purim. The miracle of Purim is, I know who I am. Mordechai is my people. Haman, I don't care. So we don't hate Haman on Purim. We don't hate him. Why should we? He doesn't threaten us. He's just out. He's Haman, he's out. Did he lose? It doesn't matter. We don't win and we don't lose. We are Jews either way. One quick story. There were these two friends before the war in Europe. They were both uh, from yeshiva. They were both observant. After the war, they met in Montreal. One of them had stopped being religious completely. He was angry. He was, And the other one became more observant so they were sitting, comparing notes. So the one who was not observant anymore asked the guy, what happened? You went through concentration camps and you came out more observant? So the guy says, I'll tell you when it happened. I was in the camp. He came late for something, or he didn't stand up quick enough, and the guard was beating him. He knocked him down, and he was kicking him, and then he put his boot on the throat of, of the Jew, and he was choking him. He says, I remember lying there, frightened, in pain, and I look up and I see this shiny, expensive boot. And then I see this uniform, pressed, clean, neat. I haven't had clean clothes in two years. And he's standing there, healthy, happy, and he's stepping on my neck. And a thought occurred to me at the moment. If God came to me and said, uh, David, you want to change places with the guard? Would you rather be him stepping on his neck? And I realized, no way. I want to be me. I want to be a Jew. I don't want to be a successful, blessed Nazi. Don't want. And that's when I realized nothing is going to change. It doesn't matter who wins and who loses physically. It doesn't matter who is more successful, less successful, who seems to be winning, uh, blessed or cursed. I'm a Jew and that's all 
that matters. And I will always be a Jew. That's Purim. Since that time, Jews have this feeling. You don't become Jewish by practicing a religion. Judaism is not our religion. Judaism is us. And we are not trying to get closer to God. We are close. All we want to know is, what does God need from us? To be holy in Israel? Fine. To be holy in Persia? Okay. To be holy in New York? That's hard. <laughs> but we'll try. We'll do it. So, the rabbi says, don't give up hope. You know why? Oh, some people will say, because God will answer you. Just cry from the bottom of your heart. I don't think so. Don't give up hope because God is kind. If you ask nicely, he's very generous. He will give you. I don't think so. You don't give up hope because what you need, he needs even more. You want to get married? You're giving up hope? Who asked you to get married? I and mean, besides your mother. God invented marriage. God said, it is not good for man to be alone. It's his idea. He wants you married more than you want to be married. Because he'll get all the benefits and none of the pain. <laughs> So why should you be confident that you will find your bashert and you will get married? Because you don't have to convince him. So listen to this. Never say, I'm going to get married im yirtza Hashem. You know why? <laughs> what do you mean im yirtza Hashem? It's, it's his idea. Of course he wants. Part of the reason you should get married is because he wants, not because you want. So will I ever have children? You have to beg God? He wants you to have a dozen. You should want as much as he wants. So when we ask God to give us this brachot, we're not saying, please change your mind and be good to me. No. What you're saying is, I'm on, the, I'm on the same page. You want to give me kids? You want to give me a shidduch? You want to give me a marriage? I'm ready. He is certainly ready. He has been waiting. So this is where our confidence comes. The Jewish people will be here forever. No question, no doubt. There's nothing to even worry about. How do we know that? Because he needs us. If he needs, <laughs> of course it's going to happen. So this is what Mordechai says to Esther. Go to the king. Risk your life. Don't think you're saving the Jewish people. You know, don't, don't get a martyr complex. The Jewish people are not going anywhere. <laughs> Jews will get saved one way or the other. Don't worry about that. But you have the opportunity to do something for your people. And for that, you should go even if it risks your life. Because this is your life. Rabbi Lau, chief rabbi of Israel, was visiting the Rebbe years ago. And they spoke about the problems in Israel. And at the end, Rabbi Lau said, Rebbe, what's going to be? So the Rebbe said, don't ask what's going to be. Ask what can we do? So I was thinking about this. I just heard this recently, this little conversation. Why not ask what's going to be? Why is that not a good question? 
The Rebbe says, don't ask what's going to be. Why not? Hmm? What's wrong with asking what's going to be? Huh? Ah. I thought of two reasons. Reason number one is, uh, I don't want to talk about that, it's too depressing. What's going to be? Uh, I don't know. Uh, let's not even go there. That doesn't sound like the Rebbe. The other reason is, what's going to be? That's not something we can control, so why are we talking about it? Let's talk about what we can control. Let's talk about what we can do. A little better. But if you know the Rebbe's character and the Rebbe's style, to the Rebbe, what's going to be? You're worried? What's going to be? Mashiach is going to come. The world is going to become perfect. We're going to live in a godly world. And we're going to spend all our time getting to know God better. What do you mean, what's going to be? We know what's going to be. <laughs> the question is when. <laughs> but we know what's going to be. What's going to be is wonderful. If what's going to be is wonderful, then why do we have to ask what we can do? Don't do anything. It's going to be wonderful. This is the Jewish mentality. It's going to be wonderful. Mordechai will always be Mordechai, and Haman will always hang. <laughs> so what are we worried about? Mordechai says to Esther, you're worried about the Jewish people? What's going to be? Don't worry what's going to be. Jews will be fine. So what is there to worry about? Whether you did your part. That's all. And for that, you should give every ounce of your devotion. For that, you should even risk your life to make sure that you did your part. That's all. So the Rebbe says to him, why are you asking what's going to be? What's going to be is fine. The question is, will you be able to say when Mashiach comes, will you be able to say, I helped, I did my part? Or are you going to stand there when everything becomes perfect and feel a little embarrassed because you didn't do your part? So why do you have to make an effort to get married? Why do you have to make an effort to have children, God forbid, if people are having difficulties? Why make an effort? God wants. It's all going to be good. That's true. But if we don't do our part, then the reason for our existence, the reason for our personal being here, is not fulfilled. So you know this guy who's suing his parents? Uh, yeah. He's suing his parents for giving birth to him without his consent. Huh? He's 27. <laughs> He's a late bloomer. If you object to being born without your consent, where were you for 27 years? Why didn't you complain at your bar mitzvah? <laughs> But I find, I find it fascinating, not just silly. By the way, it already, it already went to court, and it was, it was thrown out of court because they couldn't figure out how the parents were supposed to get his consent before he was born. Yeah, that's good, too. That's funny. 27, too late. So they threw it out of court. And both his parents are lawyers. It must be a crazy family. So the fascinating thing about it is he's right, isn't he? We are born without our consent. And if something happens to you without your consent, 
you have the right to be upset. If it wasn't your idea, and it's not working out so good because you have to pay bills, you have a right to be upset. And the parents should pay the bills. It's their fault. This idea, this fact, we don't ask to be born. Isn't that amazing? The most important, the most precious, the most absolutely vital thing, life itself, we don't ask for it. And why don't we ask for it? Because we don't need it. We don't need it. It's true. We don't need to be born. So when a person says, you know, I don't need this, welcome to the club. Nobody needs this. Nobody asks to be born because nobody needs to be born. So if you follow the logic, if I don't ask because I don't need, then why am I here? That's the best question in the world. And the answer is, you didn't ask to be born, you don't need to be born, and you didn't make yourself be born, you didn't create yourself. So who created you? Whoever created you obviously needs you to be born. So why are you here? To serve his need, because you don't need this. If we could get to this point, intoxicated like Purim, intoxicated by the thought, I have no needs. I didn't even ask to be born. So living, dying, heaven, earth, I don't care. This is not my problem. Then what is my problem? My problem is that in God's vast eternal plan and his huge divine need, I have a little role to play. And I'm worried that I'm not playing my role. That's all. There is something he needs from me that he's not going to get from anybody else, and I'm a little worried that I'm going to fail at that. I'm going to fail him, because he needs, I don't need anything. That's called drunk. That's called intoxicated, and that's called happy. Can you imagine? If you really felt I don't need anything. I have to pay bills. He did that. Animals don't pay bills. Only human beings have to work and buy and, and, and cook. And, and Whose idea was that? His. I don't need it. So again, be careful how you speak. I need a job. Actually, I don't need a job. I don't need a job. I just need the money. Well, actually, I don't need the money. I don't need anything. I would be fine if I was never created. I need to eat. I need to eat? What was this, my idea? I wake up in the morning and I have to eat. I don't know why. This is not coming from me. I was created like this. So bottom line, all the things I need, I don't need. <laughs> God decided I need to eat. He decided I need to sleep. He decided I need to breathe. I don't need any of it. That's a big relief. A lot of pressure off of me. Now the Torah comes along and says, you're Jewish. You don't need to become godly. You don't need to become religious. You don't need to improve yourself. I'm free. Unemployed. <laughs> and then God comes and says, so uh, can you help me out a little bit? Because I have a need. I need you to make the rest of the world holy. 
So if you have a minute, can you pitch in? Because if everybody does their share, it'll all happen. That is a Purim mentality. And there should be Purim every day. So relax. You don't need anything. God needs you to get married. If you're ready, if you're willing, he'll make it happen. God needs you to start a family. God needs you to spread godliness into the world. It'll happen. Just do your little share, that's all. Everything else is his fault, not your problem. Maybe that's why we have to live in a free society. Before Mashiach comes, we have to be challenged by the freedom of religion, not the oppression of religion. You are free to serve God. Serve Him means you don't have to become better, you have to make the world better. This boy was, spent some time in Crown Heights and he was going back to college. So when he said goodbye to the Rebbe, the Rebbe said to him, when you get back on campus, remind your friends to put on tefillin. He said, the Rebbe, I don't put on tefillin. The Rebbe said, so? What does that got to do with your friends? You should put on tefillin. So should they. So you don't want to? So get them to do it. <laughs> Why should they miss out because you're a bad boy? In other words, Judaism doesn't mean how religious can you be? How firm can you be? That's not the question. The question is, you're walking around with a little piece of God inside yourself. What are you going to do? Keep it under your mattress? It's all for you? So the first thing is, give birth to another Jew. Share it. Increase it. Spread it. And then look around. How many people can you help? How many people can you inspire? How many people can you benefit? That's what we're here for. This make sense? Only to a Jew. <laughs> it doesn't make sense to anybody else. But we're Jewish. So to us it makes sense. And it's true. So have a very happy Purim. Appreciate who you are. And don't be stingy. Share it make everybody else happy. And then God will be happy with his world and that's what we're here for. That's the bottom line. <clears throat> this is why in the Megillah, we are not called children of Israel. First time. Up until the Megillah, Esther, every place in the Torah where it speaks about us, we are the children of Israel, B'nai Israel comes to the Megillah, and all of a sudden we are Yehudim. The, the realization, the actualization of who we are happened on Purim. Until Purim, we thought we were B'nai Yisrael. We had a grandfather whose name was Yisrael, and we we're part of that family. So it's because of him that we're Jewish. On Purim, we realized it's not because of anybody or anything. I am a Yehudi. I am Jewish, not my great-grandfather. Not, not because of my great-grandfather. So, 
we've come a thousand years since then or more it's really sunk in we really are Jewish so lighten up get intoxicated don't make yourself better share what you have and the world will be better if you enjoyed this conversation or this topic and you're looking for more information or you want to hear it again from another angle there is a way to do that and that is in this book it's all there order it from amazon you can read it reread it and share it i want to invite you to join us as vips partners in our work and join us also for uh, a personal chat with other members of the VIP club. We talk about many things. There's an opportunity to ask, to respond, to make a comment, to meet the other supporters. And together we can really make a difference in Jewish life and in life in general. So join us. It's good to know dot org log in call make contact and join us with the vips